Hello, hello again. It's another Aga Color reaction today. It's another date night. Yay! Mm -hmm. Awesome. And we have Eric here, and we'll be watching something that he might be inter find interesting. Uh, the History of American Chip Flavors by JJ McCullough. Cool. Right on. Yeah. And uh, let's just jump in. Jump in and just see the chip flavors. I'm not big for chip fla chips. I mean, paper chips. Flavors. Chips in general. I mean, I eat those tortilla chips sometimes, the corn ones, just plain corn ones. I like them, but I mean, I won't say no if someone has some kind of interesting flavor, but. Hello, friends. My name is JJ. And one topic that I've had a lot of fun making videos about lately is this idea of the American cultural canon. A canon, in the one end non bang bang sense of the word, refers to an official list of things that are understood to be part of a recognized set. And when it comes to contemporary American culture, there are all sorts of standardized sets of things that are fun to explore. In the past, we've done a video on the American monster canon that includes Frankenstein, Dracula, and the mummy, as well as one on the American candy flavor canon, which includes lemon, lime, orange, strawberry, and cherry. And today, we are going to talk about the American potato chip flavor canon. I was just going so to ask you, the chip, when you say chip, chip in America, do you just mean the potato the chips or all of the other ones too? Chips in general, like, they're all chips. crisp, yeah. Mm -hmm. Consists of plain sour cream and onion, barbecue, and salt and vinegar. Living on this continent, you just sort of take these flavors for granted as normal and probably don't often pause to ponder just how unique and arbitrary they are. Many foreign countries, after all, their potato chip flavor canon is completely different. I remember when I was in Holland, pepper flavor chips in the sense of green or red pepper flavor were very common. In many parts of Asia, meanwhile, shrimp flavor is one of their standards. These are grilled prawn flavor from Thailand. Even in America itself, there was a time when some companies were trying to make peanut butter flavored chips, I think. But let us just take a step back a bit and talk about how potato chips came to be in the first place, because we cannot begin to talk about flavors before getting into the uniquely American history of this most American of snacks. So potatoes are actually indigenous to the United States with the wild versions of the plant found mostly in the southern half of the country. It was in Latin and South America, however, where potatoes of the sort we know today were first actively cultivated as a versatile food source by the native peoples. It is believed that the Spanish brought potatoes to Europe sometime in the late 16th century, but because they were so easy to grow, even on really bad land, they quickly became associated with peasants and were looked down on. He looks like he's sitting on like a bouncy meat. ball or something. Gross farmer food. Only the wretched eat the roots was apparently a common saying at the time. This was much less the case in the humble and democratic United States, however, who really took to farming potatoes in both the colonial and post-colonial eras. Add in an influx of Irish immigrants whose potato-eating ways had made them the subject of weird scorn in Europe, and by the 19th century, potatoes had become a very mainstream American food, enjoyed by men and women of all social classes. In fact, in Victorian era America, potatoes were even served at some of the country's most it's fancy restaurants. How often? Moon's Lake House. Actually, no. Oh. How often did you eat potatoes when... Uh, in classy Saratoga Spring in Victoria. When, when you were living in the States. I'm not talking about fries, because of or chips. Yeah, we'd have mashed potatoes with KFC. Yeah, but like, if you would be cooking at home, if you were cooking. Rarely. Yeah. <laughs> but even when you were a kid or something like that, how often yeah. would you eat potatoes at home? Not often. No? No. Huh. I'm just kind of wondering, because it's like, we pretty much eat potatoes every day. Mm. I just wonder. I just wonder. In era America, potatoes were even served at some of the country's most Fancy restaurants like Moon's Lake House in classy Saratoga Springs, New York. There is a very famous story about this place that I'm sure you've heard about how the restaurant had this very snotty cook who really hated customers who sent back the food. And then one day in 1853, the great railroad tycoon Cornelius Vanderbilt 
tried to send back some potato dish that he considered undercooked, and the chef went ballistic and responded by trying to make him the most repulsive potato abomination he could muster, but instead he just wound up creating potato chips and everybody loved them. According to this <laughs> excellent book on the history of potato chips, however, there doesn't seem to be a lot of hard evidence that this story actually happened, although potato chips were almost certainly invented at this restaurant. The author seems to think it is more likely that the cook's sister actually invented them in a less theatrically compelling accent. But in any case, the Saratoga chips, as they were first known, were quickly put on the menu of restaurants and stores across New York and in surrounding states as well, particularly Ohio and Pennsylvania, which even today are said to have the strongest potato chip culture in the U.S. The industry even refers to this part of America as the potato chip belt, just because of how nuts people are for chips in this area. If you are from there, you can tell me if this is true. So much like candy, potato chips only really started to go mainstream in the early 20th century when factory technology of the late industrial revolution allowed machines to process and peel and fry potatoes at a massive scale, as well as seal them in little bags of wax paper or foil that could be individually sold at stores. Before then, you had to buy chips in bulk with the scoop, like nuts. Now, America didn't really have a lot of nationwide food brands until after World War II. A lot of the big, iconic companies that exist today are simply the result of savvy entrepreneurs buying up a bunch of smaller regional companies. This was definitely the case with chips. Throughout the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, a big company called Frito and another company called Lay went around the US buying up all of the small chip companies before merging into a single giant chip conglomerate called Frito Lay in 1962. This company then merged with Pepsi in 1965 creating a snack food juggernaut that still produces over 60% of all chips sold in America. Second place is Pringles, which was a brand created by the Procter & Gamble Corporation in 1971. The rise of these companies heralded the dawn of a more uniform standard of potato chip across the United States in terms of shape, crunch, and of course, flavor. But first, onions. So onions originate somewhere in the big Far onion. East and were brought to Europe by the it's Romans. Nice like potatoes, <laughs> yeah. onions are also a pretty simple thing to grow. And as a result, the Europeans had a lot of similar snobbery towards people who grew or ate them as a result. Although what's interesting is that in this case, it was a very Northern Europe versus Southern Europe sort of thing. In England, especially from about the 17th century on, onions were considered an extremely low class sort of food with people who ate a lot of onions and thus smelled like onions being considered the most repulsive sort of person. In the real old days, there was even a thinking that the pungent taste of onions would rile up your blood and make you violent or horny. But in other parts of Europe, it was a completely different story. The Spanish, Greeks, and Italians all ate a lot of onions, which the British would cite as evidence of their moral superiority over the continent. Although it was sometimes a bit surprising to the Brits that even the French, who they thought of as being closer to their civilizational equals, ate onions too. In this book, about the history of onions, it describes the British history poet Percy onions. Shelley visiting France <laughs> in being shocked yeah. to discover that aristocrats in Paris ate onions in their food, like common hillbillies. But once again, the egalitarian sensibilities of America prevented that sort of snobbishness from taking hold there. America welcomed a lot of immigrants from the onion-eating parts of Europe in the late 19th century, and they helped normalize both eating and growing the vegetable which is objectively very delicious. One popular onion dish that wound up catching on with middle-class America was onion soup. The French like to take credit for inventing this, but it's not exactly the most radical dish in the world that a lot of other nationalities have their version of it too. Flash forward to World War II. In order to make rations for the fighting men last longer, new technologies of food dehydration were developed. And after the war, that same technology was put to commercial use in the form of selling dehydrated foods to the status-conscious housewives of America who were eager to buy up anything that purported to be convenient and modern. The one thing that really took off was dehydrated soups, and in 1952, the Lipton Corporation started selling packets of dehydrated Lipton. onion soup. I don't know Lipton has a tea process. Yeah, me too. For the nuclear age. So barbecue is actually a very old American tradition and one that has changed less over the centuries than you might expect. The word comes from the Taino Indians of the Caribbean and means rat or smoking meat. Early European colonizers in the Americas were fascinated with the ways that Aboriginal peoples cooked meat outdoors with fire and racks and eagerly tried to copy them, making barbecue one of the earliest examples of either the great American melting pot or indigenous cultural appropriation. 
depending on how you're feeling. But yes, from practically the earliest days, Americans were having big barbecue parties, cooking conspicuous quantities of beef and pork and chicken on open flames. I mean, George Washington went to barbecues. Much like onions and potatoes, barbecues were one of the great equalizers of Americans of all social standings, with one notable exception. As wealthy Americans, particularly in the South, outsourced more of their chores like cooking to their slaves, tending to the barbecue became increasingly associated with blacks, who in turn added their own unique spin to it. Having mastered it in captivity, African Americans became a dominant force in American barbecue culture after emancipation, with barbecue restaurants becoming a popular business for free blacks looking to gain economic self-sufficiency in the post-Civil War era. After the Second World War, however, Americans started going to barbecue parties and barbecue restaurants less and less, who started barbecuing at home more and more. Owning your very own miniature charcoal or propane-powered barbecue, or better yet, a stone barbecue pit in the backyard, became one of many status symbols of prosperity and comfort among the post-war American middle class. This fine book on the history of barbecue refers to the years between 1945 and 1965 as the golden age of the American barbecue, a time when you would have been considered a bit of a weirdo, or maybe a communist, if you weren't barbecuing all the time. Any Zoomers in the audience may be delighted to learn that a it is the cliche of the barbecue man as an icon of unambitious <sighs> know, class sensibilities comes from, much like their little barbecue is it older? Is it someone older than Boomer? Pass me my phone. Let's see. <laughs> let's see. Let's check what the Zoomer is. Zoomer. A member of Generation Z born in the late 1990s or the early 21st century perceived as being familiar with the use of digital technology, the internet. Okay. Very young age. Gen Z only just entering the workforce, the oldest Zoomers are in their early 20s. And then the second thing says, a member of the baby boom generation who chooses to pursue a particularly active lifestyle in middle age or retirement. The modern Zoomer doesn't want to retire, they want to continue to earn money while having the life that they want. Hmm. So that's somewhat older. So it's kind of misleading. We prefabricated and machine made with factory processed hamburger patties and hot dogs taking well, the place of traditional ribs and steaks. Can and just so families mm -hmm. wouldn't have to go through all the hassle of whipping up their own seasonings or glazes for the meats, supermarkets soon began selling ready-made Barbecue sauce, sauces like this one by the Kraft Food Corporation, which has since risen to become the most popular barbecue sauce in America. It is a mildly tangy concoction of tomatoes and molasses, sort of loosely based on a type of sauce that had been popular with some barbecuers in the South, only with a lot more sugar. I know that to this day, a lot of the real hardcore barbecue restaurateurs have nothing but contempt for supermarket barbecue sauce, which they view about the same way that Mexicans view Taco Bell. By the 1970s, your average American was eating four pounds of potato chips a year, with potato chips counting for 50% of all American snack foods, at least according to this 1975 press release from the American Potato Chip Institute. But delicious though they might be, there are only so many salty potato discs you can choke down before you start to get bored. So what did the ever-innovative American people do to make their chip-eating experience more exciting? Why, dip them in something, of course, Chocolate. like barbecue sauce. Oh. That stuff goes with anything. Uh, look like chocolate, yeah. 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 Shortly after that Lipton onion soup mix was I mean, invented, salty and chocolatey? I like it. craze of mixing onion soup mix with sour cream to create a delightful new sauce that was perfect for dipping chips in. Some people said it was like biting into a delicious baked potato with sour cream and chopped up onions. Yeah. Beloved of America's many iconic potato-based dishes. The Lipton people certainly got big dollar signs in their eyes when they heard about this and began actively mm, pushing the idea that you could buy their soup and make California dip in all of their advertisements. When you read about the history of this, they often make a big deal of the fact that Lipton sponsored a very popular TV show in the 1950s called Talent Scouts. And the host of that show often played up the California dip angle as one of the great selling points why you would want to buy the dehydrated soup, even if you weren't a big soup guy. But while Americans can be a very entrepreneurial people, they can also be a tad lazy. Surely there has to be a more convenient way to get sauces on our chips, they cried. And the corporations, 
heard those cries. In 1958, during the height of the middle-class barbecue craze, Lay's unveiled barbecue sauce-flavored chips, and they became a huge smash hit. In the early 1970s, Lay's followed up with sour cream and onion flavored chips. Take that, Lipton. So vinegar is basically just alcohol that has gone bad. In fact, the English word vinegar is just an anglicization of the French term vin agar, or sour wine. It refers to how when alcohol is exposed to oxygen for a prolonged period of time, it transforms into a kind of sour acid. That being the case, vinegar is one of the oldest and most universal foodstuffs on earth, present in some form in basically any culture that has ever had liquor. In a time before spices and sugar were widely available, vinegar was often used to give food a bit more flavor. Like many early condiments, it was also a popular way to mask the often disgusting taste of old-timey food. Our old pals the English, who were too good for onions, used a vinegar made from malt ale as one of their favorite seasonings. It was particularly popular as a topping for deep-fried fish and french fries, which became a ubiquitous staple of the British diet in the 19th century. Depending on who you listen to, dousing this kind of heavily fried food in vinegar either covers up or accentuates the greasy flavor. So British immigration to the United States greatly declined in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but well into the post-war era, there were still thousands of Brits coming every year. But the big thing that changed was that this later wave of British immigrants more consciously thought of themselves as exotic foreigners than the generations prior. Because obviously, after about the first century or so of independence, Britain and the United States had experienced significant cultural deviation from each other, including in the realm of food. So this was when you started to see the rise of the British pub as one more style of ethnic restaurant in America's multicultural milieu, offering Americans a taste of the many foods that had arisen in the motherland since the nasty business of 1776, including fish and chips and vinegar. The thinking is that the popularity of fish and chips in post-war America and the association of vinegar with salted potato products primed Americans to eagerly embrace what would become the third and final great American chip flavor, salt and vinegar, which was introduced not by Lay's, but the much smaller Tacoma-based chip company, Nally, in the early 70s. Salt and vinegar was actually originally a British chip flavor, but the Nally people thought that Americans might go for it, given the popularity of British pub food in the 50s and 60s. As you can see from their early chip bag design, they really leaned hard into the whole British angle at first. British pub food is still popular in America, and fish and chips in particular has become a dish that you can now buy in basically every American middle-class chain restaurant, from Red Lobster to Cheesecake Factory. But what's fascinating is how the stylized simulacra of salt and vinegar chips has proven more popular with Americans in the long term than the British practice of actually putting vinegar on the french fries that inspired the flavor in the first place. It is actually one of the great paradoxes of American-British cultural relations that so many Americans these days would regard putting vinegar on their fries as something very strange and foreign, even as they now wolf down more salt and vinegar chips than anywhere else on earth. So there you have it, four distinct flavors of chips, each one containing within them an elaborate tale of America's it's cultural evolution as a Bye, vibrant, barbecue. independent barbecue? nation. Yeah. If you are from a non-American nation, merely spent some time in one, I would be curious to hear you share your insights into the potato chip flavor canon of another country in the comments below. And I will see you all next week. Ladies in Poland, we're doing this um, limited edition flavor of chanterelle mushroom. Yeah. Could never find it. it was mm. really, I was really uh, distraught. Whenever I was in Poland, I could never find uh, that flavor and I really love those mushrooms. It was actually chanterelles with cream. Well, I love the chanterelle cream sauce. Delicious. I can't find it anyway. So I never yeah, tried. Yeah. Just horrible. Mm -hmm. That would be cheap though. I'm looking looking out there for, for them whenever I'm in Poland. Or Polish store. And but no, sometimes I would have some craving for chips, but I would rather go for the tortilla chips now than go for Lay's or something else. And then there's those puff ones, you know, like kind of corn thing, the puffy like they're like Cheetos. They kind of similar texture, I think. But they're a bit bigger and they are usually they're sweet, like they're, they're chocolate or you can get them strawberry. But you don't, we don't really call them chips because chips in Poland would be just strictly for potato chips. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just say, so you know. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah then before we move there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you have to say? No, nothing for me. Nothing? He's very tired today. Mm. He woke up at all early on his own. 
Yeah, it happens. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow when you see you next week. Bye!